Well, hi, I'm Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Marco Presbyterian Church, and we're so grateful that you've landed here. We intend for this content to be used in conjunction with a local church that you belong to so that you might grow in the Lord. If you're not connected to a church, please connect here to Marco Presbyterian Church. And if you're blessed by this content, consider giving to Marco Church. We love you and we want you to be blessed. We hope that this brings hope to your heart. church how are we doing this morning good um just so you know if you didn't know my name just yet i am jose ramirez i'm the student ministry director here at marco presbyterian uh so what does that mean uh, well that means is that i oversee really 6th through 12th graders in their walk and really encourage them uh to grow in their faith with god and, and just live a life glorifying god um, and so it's a, it's a joy to be here this morning, especially just a joy to be here at Marco Presbyterian. Um, and it's just a joy to see uh, even what students are doing, even to our young kids. And, and I just want to thank, uh, I don't think she gets thanked enough, uh, Katie Nance, and she's probably going to hate me for <laughs> calling her out. But she's doing a faithful work, uh, even with our younger kids here. So it's just a really exciting place to be. Um, and so just so you guys know, for if you're, if you're here for a long time, and if you didn't really know this, uh, there are 64,000 kids and teenagers in Collier County. Like th that's, that's a big number. And just here in Marco Island, there's 1,149, right? So there's a huge field here. Uh, here's, and I just kind of want us to uh, paint a picture of kind of what kids, teenagers, and, and young adults are, are facing today and kind of what's going on. And so if you're, if you're older, I don't want you to check out just yet. I actually encourage you to listen even more because we, we really need you. We need all generations uh, to really be working together to, to uh, bring Christ to people and lead others. And so what is going on with the younger generation? So what we see is that the younger generation, uh, specifically Gen Z, we're facing a lot of problems, especially when it comes to truth. Right? And so if you're a Christian, you know truth can really only be found in the scriptures. Um, and so uh, we don't know what we believe anymore. Like we listen to the news, we maybe listen to the radio, uh, or even you, you just go on social media. We're just confused about what is true. All right? The only place we could really find truth is in the scriptures. Um, so what is happening? We, we know that adults, uh, especially if you're a parent, Right, you are exhausted, maybe mentally, physically, um, and so we're we're all coming coming out of this pandemic as well, and we're stressing ourselves out, right, as adults. And so, can you imagine like what is going on with kids, teenagers, and young adults? Like some of these younger generations are facing this for the first time, right? Some some of us in Gen Z have gone through some hard stuff, but some of us haven't, right? Like a pandemic. So we're all just taking this for the first time, um, and so. That's just really heavy on, on us. That's heavy on you, the older generation. So what is that doing to our minds? What is that doing to your minds when you're exhausted and you're tapped out? All right, what is happening? I think we're, we're, we're seeing here, especially in southwest Florida, there's a culture of people not knowing Christ. Right? There's parents uh, that are being worn out. And so we have students that don't go to church. Right? We have parents that don't send their kids to church because why would they? They... They have no promises to the church. Uh, they, they're, they're not invested in it. So you have a lot of students that don't even know Jesus. Um, and so we're exhausted and we're having a hard time just uh, encouraging students to be in the Word, to, to have a prayerful life, uh, to come to church, to be at youth group. And since the pandemic, we've actually seen a really alarming drop of volunteers in the U.S. Right? Children, students, and young adults are facing mental health issues as well, right? There's anxiety, there's depression, and then there's an increase of suicide, especially in our young adults, right? We're dealing with a lot of what's going on in the world, and that is affecting our minds, right? And then there's a huge in increase of dependency on social media and really our phones, right? That's not just the younger generation. That is all of us here. And so we're all in that. We're all going to these places to find an escape, 
The world and the enemy are really taking the lead on how to sh uh, shaping the minds of our younger generation. And so what's going on is that we're all, all exhausted, we're all tired, so who is speaking into the lives of kids, students, and young adults? Like, it's not a very high Christian influence. Right? The majority is struggling. We're all watching things that, uh, that aren't telling the truth about who Jesus is. And what that's creating is, is confusion, right? And we, Gen Z, are confused about who we are, what we're supposed to do. And these outside influences are, just keep coming in and in. So what are we going to do? What, what are you going to do? Are we going to run to God? Or are we just going to hide in our comfort? Right? I've, I've been in student ministry for a few years now. Uh, and I find that the truth is we all need to spend more time with Jesus. But what I've seen throughout the years is, uh, unfortunately, is that when it gets hard for an adult, it, 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 when it gets rough, escape to comfort and just kind of hide there. And that is not what Jesus called us to do. He's called us to really get into this. And really, we all have to spend more intimate time with God. So 75% of Gen Z, that's, that's ages 10 through 25, 75% is unchurched. There's no real concept of God or any different religion. But God has a plan, right? If you've read the scriptures through it all, God has seen very few believers. God has seen the world very corrupt. And God still has a plan. God still has it. And he will do incredible things. And I know I just gave you some bad news there and some gloomy news. Uh, but I want to share a little bit of what we're seeing uh, here in Marco Presbyterian. So in the past year, we are seeing kids and students de develop spiritual habits, like prayer, reading the word. They're wanting to invite their friends. But we really just want our students and our, and our kids to have a hunger for God and to spend more time in the word and prayer. We are seeing some of the students wanting to reach their friends and really make a big difference in the world. And we just, we're really excited to see that. So I, I encourage Marco Church, I encourage, even if you're not part of this church, I just encourage you to focus more on Christ, focus more on God. Because if we do, I really think we're going to have a revival. And I know that's like a taboo word for a Reformed church like here. But I really do believe it. And part of what Marco Church believes is that we want to bring uh, hope to, to people with the truth of Jesus. And so we have to be willing to get onto our knees. We have to be willing to pray. We have to be willing to dig in and press in into God. And acknowledge that we do not have it together as a Christian. Right? And guess what? Like, none of us never do. We won't ever have it together as a Christian. So we just need to depend on God. We need to run to Him. It's really important. So let's, let's dig into some scripture and pray. Uh, so your, our text this morning will be in 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 to 10. If you have your Bible or your phone, uh, there's also uh, Bibles in front of the chairs there. Um, or you could go on the MPC app as well, and it's there as well. Um, but just as you're turning there, remember this is God's reminder of just how he sees you as children of his. He, he values you. He loves you. The world is, is trying to change our minds and, and make us more chaotic. Jesus is just trying to help us remember, right? Remember that he died on the cross for you. Remember that he rose out of tomb for you and that he sent his presence, the Holy Spirit, to be your guide, your comforter, and your helper. So this is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to do verses 10, uh, 4 through 10. So if you are able to stand up, uh, we'll read together. So it says this in verse 4. So as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever blames or believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You can sit down and, and let us pray for 
Father, Lord, just thank you for this morning you've given us, Lord. Thank you uh, that we could be here and really start to dig into your word, Lord, and what uh, you've called us to do and who we are, uh, Lord. I just pray even for myself that uh, you just humble me, Lord, and um, that your word may be preached and made clear to people, Lord, and that you encourage us uh, in your word. So, Lord, I just ask, um, again, that you humble me and uh, that you, you get all the glory in all of this. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So, everyone here, uh, kids, students, young adults, adults, older generation, you're going to have to ask yourself around like three questions, right? Who am I? How did I get this identity? And what am I here for? Right? And so in this text, keep in mind, like Peter is addressing Christians here. But before we get to answering those questions, I I want you as, as believers, as Christian, uh, as Christians to know who you are not, right? Because one of the easiest ways uh, for saying to lure you back into sin is to remind you of what you were before, right? Peter says, if, if you look in verse 9, once you were not a people, and then he, he keeps going, once you had not received mercy, and he's just really honest about how things were before we found Christ, right? And then Paul fleshes this out in his letter to the Ephesians later, uh, earlier, and so when we were dead and rotting in our trespasses, and when we let the passions of our flesh uh, just have their way, when we were sons and daughters of just kind of never-ending torment, uh, we were separated from Christ, we were cut off from his promises, having no hope uh, in the world and without God in the world, that was you, Peter says. Then like in Ephesians, it says, but God. Uh, he didn't leave you to be hopeless in your trespasses and your sins, but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Peter reminds us who we once were, right? Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Whenever Satan says, look at who you are, you have the privilege to say, yes, but God. So, first question, who are you? All right, Peter gives us a few ways of describing uh, a Christian in your identity and answering who you are. So this is your first identity. You are a chosen race. I know he's talking about a corporate identity here, right? He's talking about the church. But I want to talk to you as individuals here. And I think I can because this race that he's talking about isn't racial, right? The chosen race is not black, it's not white, it's not brown. The chosen race is a new people from all different types of people, all cultures, all colors, right? We are then now made aliens and strangers in this, in this world. If you just look ahead into verse 11, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. See, what gives us our identity is not a color, it's not a culture, but chosenness. Christians are not the white race, they're the chosen race. Christians are not the black race, they are the chosen race. Christians are not the brown race, they are the chosen race. We are the black chosen, we are the white chosen, we are the brown chosen. Out of all the races, we have been chosen one at a time, not a, on the basis of belonging to one group. And that's why this is an incredible phrase for you, and to be is super cr uh, crucial for you. You are a part of the chosen race because the race is made up of individuals who were chosen from all different types of races, all different types of background. So your first identity is that you are chosen. God chose you not because of your race or any sort of qualification before that, God chose you. So why am I chosen? Who am I? I, I? I am chosen. I don't know why. There's nothing in me of value above other people. It's not because I can lift a certain amount of weight off the floor. Or I, I, I didn't have any conditions or meet any conditions to get it. It happened before I was born, and so all I got to do is just stand in awe of it. I, I got to j be in joy of it and, and just... I uh, want to be uh, accepted in it be, uh, and bow down on my knees. I want to be faithful to its purpose. I am chosen. You're chosen. We are all chosen as God's people. Your second identity is that you are God's possession. And so this is actually expressed twice in this text. In verse 9, it says, You are a people for God's own possession. And then in verse 10, You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So you are chosen by God. So, and that effect of that mercy is that God takes you to be his possession. And right? now God owns everything, so in, in one sense, yeah, like, we are all God's 
uh, possession, but the fact that it explicitly says it here, it, it, it must mean something special, and it, and it does. Right? You are God's inheritance. You are the ones that he aims to spend eternity with. So when God says in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, I will be their God and they will be my people, they will be my possession, that means that I will dwell with them and walk among them. You are chosen, you are God's possession, and the ones that he will walk among and, and reveal himself in a personal relation forever. Your third identity is that you are holy. You have been chosen and you are possessed by God, and therefore you're not just part of the world anymore. You are set apart by God. You exist for God, and since God is holy, you are holy. You share his character because he chose you. You're his possession. You are holy. You are in the world, but not of the world anymore, for your identity is in the holiness of our Lord. So you are holy. And then your fourth identity is that you're, you are a royal priest. You're chosen by God, you're possessed by God, and you're, you're made holy like God, and you're royal priest to God. So the point here first is that you have immediate access to God. You don't, you don't need any other human uh, mediator. Right? God provided the one mediator between God and man, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have direct access to God through God. So you can fall down on your face anytime, anywhere, and be in prayer. God will look at you and say, you are my priest. I receive you. Ask of what you want on behalf of your friends and your family or your, anyone that you know. And that is a joy to have. It was a privilege to have to be able to intercede for one another. And so the amazing thing is, is that we do get to pray for one another. We get to care for one another. But there's more. Felt like that was a commercial, like, well, wait, there's more. But um, you have an active role in the presence of God. You're not just chosen, you're not just possessed, you're not just made holy, just for you to waste your time doing nothing. Right? You are now called to be a minister in the presence of God. And I know we have an older generation here, and some of us are probably retired, but you cannot retire from this identity. All your life is a, is a priestly service. You're never out of God's presence. You are never in a neutral zone. You're always in the temple. And so your life is either going to be a spiritual service of worship or you are out of character. So you can see that this identity, this question, who are you, leads directly to the question, what are you here for? Your identity leads to your, your destiny. You are chosen, you're possessed, you're holy, all for the purposes to be a minister as priests, right? And in, in the heart of that ministry, Peter describes for us very clearly. But before we get to answer, what are we here for? I, I want us to pause for a moment and just to make it real clear in answering the middle question. How did I get this identity? And I, the, the answer is almost too obvious, right? You could answer with Sunday school answers, which is like God, Jesus, Bible, Holy Spirit, right? Like if you're in a, Holy, if you're in a Sunday, uh, Sunday school and you're not paying attention and you get called out, you could, you're probably good with saying one of those four, right? But the, the, the answer is obvious, right? We get our identity from God, right? In fact, our identity is our relation to God. We are chosen by God. We are possessed by God. We are set apart as holy by God, and we are invested as royal priests by God. And so Peter says this in his summary statement in verse 9. He refers to God like this, him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what is that marvelous light? Look, the light is that we live and being chosen and being possessed and being holy and being priestly. And the way we get there is that God, God has called us. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the answer to that question, how did we get this identity? God gave it to us. He gave it to us by his irresistible call. God gave us the identity we have. So the last question, what, what are you here for? Right, what we saw is our identity led directly to our destiny. We are chosen, we are possessed, we are made holy. We're all for the sake of being a royal priesthood. But Peter is even more specific when he tells us the precise reason for our existence. He says this in verse 9, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the full-time destiny of a royal priest, to make the glories of our king known. So how do you view yourself? It's a very important question to ask yourself, and what I hope you hear this morning is that from a biblical angle, is that it's not the defined in terms of uh, in and of ourselves, it's actually defined in terms of what God does to us in the relationship uh, God creates with us and God 
uh, in the destiny that he appoints for us. Our identity is not found in a mirror. It's not found in how many tweets you post. It's not found if you're correct in an argument. In other words, as a Christian, you cannot talk about your identity without talking about the action God, uh, of God on you. You cannot talk about your identity without the relationship God created with you. You cannot talk about your identity without the purpose of God for you. So the biblical understanding of your self-identity is radically God-centered. So who am I? Who are you? You're a God-chosen one. You're a God-possessed one. And you're a God-sanctified one. Our identity is not an end in itself, but for the sake of priestly service. God made us who we are so that we may proclaim the excellency of his freedom in choosing us. Right? The excellencies of his authority and power in possessing us, the excellencies and his uh, worth and purity in making us holy. In other words, our identity is made known when we proclaim his identity. God made us who we are so the world could know our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our identity is for the sake of making his identity known. The meaning of our identity is that the, the excellency of God be seen in us. So therefore, being a Christian and making the greatness of God known are almost identical, right? We do this at, at a Sunday morning service, like here. We, we read, uh, we preach, we sing, um, and we pray the word, right? But being a Christian is not just on a Sunday morning. It's not even just on a Sunday, right? There's six other days in the week. Being a Christian is, is a lifelong act of, ser- uh, act of worship and service to our Lord and Savior. So one of, the, one of the few things that you can do is to plug in to one of our ministries. Our right? student ministry is in need of people, of leaders that wants to make disciples, we, we, uh, to lead a small group of students throughout the week. The kids' ministry is, is in need of crew leaders to have a successful VBS. So get involved. And if you can't get involved with that, we, we have a, a other stuff for you to do as well. We have small groups uh, happening where you can uh, just be with each other um, of what God has been for us or what you need God to be with you to encourage one another. Uh, or you could just do it at work, right? When you're having lunch with somebody, you could just be uh, telling them why you are thankful for a God like him. We could do it a thousand different ways of love. Uh, that fit our own situations and our own types of personalities. But the unbeliever is um, not that much different than us. So I know I just talked about how our identity is different, but it's different because of the gospel. Right? We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. These sins are, are greed, rebellion, arrogance, and we all behave like this at some point, haven't we? Right, because of our sins, there was a divine judgment waiting for us on a day that nobody knows. We would have stood before a, a holy God. And what would we have said? We, we would have deserved the punishment, right? Where would we have hide? Are, are we going to hide in our degrees? Are we going to hide in our social media posts? Are we going to hide in our skills? Are we going to hide in our intellect? There would be no place to go and hide. There would have been nowhere to hide. There would have been things, those things would have been helpful to maybe hide here on earth, but before a holy God, we would have been, he would have seen it straight through. There had been nothing for us to redirect God's wrath to, unto another, but in God's kingdom and kindness, I mean, he, here came Jesus, right? Our master and our Lord stood in our place. The sins of the ungodly were placed on him. And on him was placed the wrath of God. And on him was placed the punishment of hell that we deserved. And by saying it is finished and by rising from the grave, we are given a completely new identity. We are given his identity, his righteousness. Death passes over us. Eternal life is given to us by his grace and in faith alone. If you haven't given your life to Christ, man, I would love to talk to you if you want to take those next steps. We have elders here that would love to talk to you. And what just kind of that looks like for you. But I'll close with this story uh, of a missionary named Doug Nichols. So Doug Nichols uh, made the excellencies or proclaimed the excellencies of our God uh, or be made known in a tuberculosis hospital. Uh, He was a missionary in India in 1967, and so uh, he he got uh, tuberculosis at some point. 
And so he, he went to the hospital. He was there for several months. And while he was there, he was trying to pass out like, these booklets of the Gospel of John. Uh, but no one would take them, right? They, they would see him as just another rich American trying to take their place. Right? And so they would either tear them up or, or throw them right at his face. And so at one point, uh, for several nights, he would wake up coughing at 2 a.m., and he would notice a little old man trying to get out of bed and trying to go to the bathroom. But the man, in his weakness and sickness, he, he couldn't stand up. Right? He, he couldn't go to the bathroom, so he just began to cry. And he just laid back in, in bed, and then in the morning, the smell was just so horrible that everyone in the hospital was angry at this old man, and that even the nurse that cleaned up after him smacked him in, uh, the old man for just making such a mess. And so the next night, the very same thing happened. Uh, Doug woke up from his own sickness and weak, uh, weakness, and he saw the old man trying to get out of bed again. Again, he couldn't, he couldn't stand up, and so he began to cry. So Doug got out of his bed and went over to the old man, and it's like the middle of the night, so like the old man's pretty scared, but uh, Doug picked him up with both his arms and carried him to the bathroom, which was just a hole in the floor and then brought him back, and the man kissed him on the cheek when he put him back to bed. So what happened is that the next morning, he woke up from a tap on his shoulder, and it was an Indian man kind of gesturing towards the booklet uh, that, that he was trying to give, give out. And then another came, and then another, and another, until basically the whole hospital had a booklet of John. All because Doug of helping an old man get to the bathroom. Right, so in other words, one way you can declare the excellencies of God is to act them out. Right, when we act out the excellencies of God, people want to say, like, I want this Jesus. This Jesus sounds great. I need this Jesus in my life. It's just another way of saying that your identity, who we are, is for the sake of God. God made us who we are to show the world who he is. Let us pray. Father, Lord, just thank you. Um, being so kind to uh, sinners like us, Lord, to, um, to just walk among our brokenness, Lord, um, and to just dive deep into our brokenness, Lord, because we, we need help. We need you, Lord, the one that could fulfill all our needs. Because what, what other hope do we have in life and death, Lord, but just in you alone, so, Lord, we just want uh, to praise you and declare your excellencies to, to everyone that we meet, Lord, in, in, in action and in word, Lord. Father, we love you. In Jesus Christ, we, we pray. Amen.